Thank you very much, Ralph. <coughs> uh, let me say at the start that I find myself in a somewhat awkward position here uh, since I want to talk about uh, issues from the point of view of a clinician. And uh, I am not a clinician, uh, at least not a licensed one, although some of my best friends are. And uh, so I, <laughs> uh, despite their role in recruiting me to Yale. <laughs> so uh, having said that, uh, I feel my job here is to uh, primarily ask questions that uh, hopefully will feed into the discussion, but also I'd like to begin with presenting a point of view that I think is quite different from what we were discussing yesterday. And I think it's kind of essential uh, to have on the table in terms of thinking about evidence that would guide patient management. So here I think we want to put aside thinking about the design of studies as discussed yesterday, whether they come in the form of RCTs, observational studies, or what have you. And what I think needs some focus is the concept of an inquiry. So I'm thinking now of the clinician having a given patient in front of him or her and uh, with a rather elaborate patient record. And included in the patient record should indeed be the biomarker information that Ralph referred to, the, pra the patient experience information as hopefully elicited by the patient that Mary Charlson had uh, strongly emphasized yesterday and I think deserves more emphasis. In addition, there's a clinical history, so we're not talking about information from a snapshot over time. There's hopefully a psychosocial well-being history. And the clinician's job here is to ask questions about what is to be the likely performance of, let me say, a contemplated treatment regimen, not just at one point in time, but it's a, a treatment regimen, or maybe I should say regimens, that are to be adjusted and changed adaptively as the patient condition evolves over time. And so at the first juncture where such a question is being asked, what the physician wants to do is conduct an inquiry, not a study. And the inquiry is to, to my mind, a very large database which can consist of RCTs, observational studies, archived records, much of the, uh, in fact, much in the spirit of what was uh, nicely di uh, discussed by Steve Cummings in yesterday's discussion. And the question that the clinician would be asking is, first, who are the approximate matches to the patient in front of me? Because what, uh, and by approximate matches, it would be not approximate matches on particular variables. And indeed, I think the variable is not what you want to focus on. What you want to focus on is an entire history as the unit of analysis to be characterized by a description of the patient condition at multiple points in time and to ask of the database, how closely can I approximate my patient by people in this database, and then ask the further question, if I have a contemplated treatment regimen among those out there in this large uh, database, which again, I have to reemphasize, is not only from RCTs or only from observational studies or only from patient archives, but it's where you find them in all those places, and to ask what has been the experience of application of the treatment regimen to approximate matches versus those who have, who have been exposed to other treatment regimens, and then to see on the basis of those consequences, that should lead to physician decisions. So uh, I know this is uh, possibly pounding a bit on the anvil about this point about not thinking in terms of studies as we've talked about it yesterday because as I see it, that is not the clinician's question. The clinician's question is he's inquiring of the data that's already out there. What can I learn that will help this patient now? And now changes, of course, as the clock runs. And so you have this adaptive tuning. And I am, at least to my mind, I'm envisioning multiple inquiries. Now, all of this presumes that you have uh, of course, quality data in front of you. And I think in many instances, as has been discussed already yesterday, we've got quite a ways to go on that.
but I think you, need, you at least need the target in sight to see uh, where, to, where to begin in this process. So among the questions that I think, uh, to my mind, ought to be on the agenda for PCORI is, in effect, approximate matching strategies. Now, it's not, this is not something where I feel one size fits all. The nature of the patient condition, what it is you're trying to treat is going to vary dramatically. And I think what we need is basically a catalog of experience of attempting the approximate matching, having seen what happens when decisions are made on the basis of it, and then ask, have you really bought something by having this process of inquiry carried out in a quite systematic way? Now, along the way, one of the things that will no doubt come to mind is you ask, how do we evaluate this? Because now, heterogeneity springs, to, uh, springs in front of you in at least two places. One is the heterogeneity of the patients that are going to be treated. And it's also heterogeneity among physicians and physician practice. And you can't ever be in the position of saying, well, I see what happened when a given physician made decisions on the basis of accumulating this evidence from approximate matches and uh, basically, if you like, taking advice of uh, the information about harms and benefits that were uh, put, in front, uh, put in front of him versus doing what he might have done uh, you know, without going through this exercise. You can only either do it or not do it. And so you're in the same position as somebody uh, is in fact, what sits at the back at the root uh, in one of the difficulties with randomized trials, that uh, among the uh, on the treated population, you only know what happened to the treated, and you hope that the comparison group is, if you like, a good enough match to the treated group so that you can compare across them and say, well, behind the scenes, what I'm really trying to do is say, what would have happened to this patient if he or she had not been treated versus what happened if he or she was treated, but only one thing happens. And of course, the same thing is true when trying to evaluate, uh, if you like, clinician decision making on the basis of the outline that we've posed here. So I think there's a rather substantial methodological challenge connected up with all of this. And I think there's no way to get at it uh, better than start the process on individual disease conditions. Now, I'd like to conclude uh, at least this introduction with a quotation of a, from a paper of John Tukey that was published in 1977 and for reasons I don't understand, seems to have uh, almost dropped from sight. But I think it's quite relevant to uh, what we're considering here. And this is a piece that uh, John published in Science called Some Thoughts on Clinical Trials, Especially Problems of Multiplicity. And the specific quotation I have in mind, which I think is totally relevant to what uh, we're talking about here, is this. It is a difficult task to drive the nearly incompatible two-horse team. On the one hand, knowledge of a most carefully evaluated kind, the RCT, where, in particular, questions of multiplicity, meaning multiple comparisons, are faced up to. And on the other hand, informed professional opinion where impressions gained from statistically inadequate numbers of cases often, and so far as we can see, often should control the treatment of individual patients. The same physician or surgeon must be concerned with both what is his knowledge gleaned from rigorous population studies and what is his informal professional opinion, often as part of treating a single patient. I wish I understood better how to help with this essentially ambivalent task. So as far as I can see, this statement uh, put out 36 years ago is still a relevant question. And uh, as far as I can see, attempting to uh, bring some answers to bear uh, ought to be part of uh, what's on the PCORI agenda. And I think this focus on, uh, if you like, the notion of clinical inquiry, where we're trying to assemble approximate matches to individual patient histories and ask what can we learn from that or what can the clinician in the presence of a given patient learn from that is very much in the business of individual prediction. So let me stop here and uh, I think we will have now two presentations. Uh, one from Nick Tadanetti, which I think uh, 
uh, I should say in advance, I, I don't know what he's going to say, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, let me say I was quite uh, intrigued by a couple of papers I saw of his done uh, with, with Russ Altman that came with, I would say, within a hair of uh, actually do, <laughs> do, doing the, the matching process without ever calling it that, and so I'm quite interested to see uh, what, uh, what he will have to say to say there. Then we will also hear on the, uh, very much on the subject of individual prediction from Michael Catan uh, from the Cleveland Clinic. And then uh, some insight, inspiration from Peter Bach and Mitch Gale. So without further ado, Nick Tenenetti. Ten 